Hello everybody, I'm your friendly neighborhood accountant, Eric Stockhausen, and this is The Ultimate Guide to Movement Enya. What is Movement Enya? Or Ayethne as some people might call her? Well, it's an archetype combining the tempo and light control effects of the movement card set with the flexibility of the Scoia'tael leader Enya, who can easily be played in any round for pretty high value while also being played in almost every archetype other than Mulligan Scoia'tael. I have identified four variants of Movement Enya, the best of which will be our gameplay focus in this video. If you want to see me play the other three variants, I have links to those variants in the description. The first of the four variants is the Movement Deck. The full Movement Deck has a lot of tempo and grows stronger as the round becomes longer. The most notable combo in this deck is Yorvith into Geralt Ard, which can net you upwards to like 38 points, which is pretty good for two gold cards. Because it lacks any carryover though, the full movement deck can easily be bled of cards and struggle to win in the final round. This is why, if you're struggling with that, I recommend the Dwarf variant, which has lots of carryover. It uses resilience and boosting effects on the Dwarfs, notably the Mahakama Defender, to create a large board that carries over into the next round. The movement cards of Blue Mountain Commando, Sheldon Skaggs, and Zoltan Shive, which I consider the core movement cards that you would put in any deck that includes movement, gives the deck the tempo necessary to win the first round because if you're playing a dwarf deck and you lose the long round, your resilience effects are pretty much wasted as your opponent instantly passes in the next round. This deck is also very weak. The dwarf variant is very weak against control heavy decks and multiple locking effects like the ox. Speaking of control, this brings us to the third variant, the Elf variant. Where the Dwarfs are focused on having large value on the board, Elves are control focused, generally speaking. Your Dothlana Archers will help you manipulate your opponent's field in order to get a maximum value out of your multiple Scorches and other effects. You also have Mitabrak for that as well. Using the same core movement cards of Blue Mountain Commandos, Sheldon Skaggs, and Golden Shive, you can respond to your opponent not having anything that you can control on the board by pushing some tempo out and keeping ahead in points that way. This deck struggles against control resistant decks and it doesn't have very much carryover, just like the full movement deck. I think the best middle ground and best variant out of this whole these four variants is the ambush hand buffing variant. It has high tempo through the movement and ambush core set. It has moderate carryover through the hand buffing, moderate control through the elven mercenaries and the bronze spells like lacerate and shrooms, and shiru who gives us the um, scorch effect, just like which you would be using in the elf variant. And it has most importantly flexibility. There is no one way to end each game and it allows you to pick the best win condition to beat your opponent in the final round early by through seek proper sequencing. You'll have enough tempo to generally win the round usually but if you have to beat out your opponent through control effects you can be flexible in that way. Due to this flexibility, your opponent won't really know what they're supposed to do to beat you, which is the most important thing. Everybody knows how to beat a dwarf deck. But do that, and every, enough people have played against Control Enya know how to deal with the Elf variant. But not very many people have played against an ambush hand buffing deck like this in the current patch. And I think this is why it makes this deck the strongest of all four. Now, in the gameplay, I will be focusing on how to sequence your cards to have your win condition ready in response to whatever your opponent's up to. In the first two uh, games, they're going to be my gameplay. And we're going to be looking at Morin and Shiru. In the final game, we're, 
going to use some of uh, one of your fellow viewers, Adita, who has given us some gameplay, and we're going to be looking at the leader, Zoltan Shive, and what happens if you don't have all the cards in the set. Aditya, um, Aditya didn't have Shiro, instead used Igni, which is fine. Shiro is a really hard card to use sometimes. So without further ado, we're going to go into some gameplay. I hope you guys enjoy. First game is going to be against a Radovid player. When I'm up against Radovid, I generally assume that they're going to have a lot of control in the final round. But I don't know exactly what I'm going to be facing here quite off the bat. When you're at 4k and up, you don't always know. Right now I'm at a 6 game win streak. I'm going to open up with a Dragoons. When you have time sensitive cards like Dragoon, you want to play them earlier typically. Well now that I know that my opponent's playing tempo, I can more I can play a little bit more aggressively. He might have destroyed one of my Blue Mountain Commandos, but that's not that bad. Now the last rate would have been pretty fine right there, but I wanted to get ahead of the, my opponent in points. Now the last rate's a more uh, useful card because it gets rid of the armor. It does a pretty good job of weakening in his board. I'm contemplating exactly what I want to do here. I don't feel like last rating quite yet. I assume my opponent has another one of the promotes. Is that what it's called? Uh, no, it's Knight Elect. That's what they call it now. In the closed beta, it was called Promote. That card art. So now he no longer gets points per turn. I'm way ahead of my opponent by about 30 points. Be very difficult for my opponent to uh, get ahead of me here. However, I'm not afraid to continue to push this round. Why? Because my Dragoons are feeding me more and more points. Unfortunately, my Dragoons never hit my brand, but that's one of the uh, possible negative effects that could happen. I made a decision not to mulligan anything because I don't want to get <laughs> Truvial. So if I draw into Truvial, I can push her out next round. It would have been fine to uh, have mulliganed thinking about it, but decided against it. I actually really do like my hand, as is. Okay. I didn't exactly see what my opponent revived, and I uh, should have checked. But I assumed he had revived both a Eskel and a Vesemir, or a Lambert and a Vesemir, and left one of the five strength cards in his deck, which is a mistake. So I'm going to open up with my time-sensitive card. That's generally what you should do. Argument could be made for uh, getting the Dragoon out faster because it's worth more points, generally speaking. But I'll live. Now I'm going to be buffing up my Bran. That's always a safe thing to do. I actually buff up my Moran. That was an accident. Forgive me. <laughs> It'll be fine. So I'm up against an armor deck, so I kind of expect cards like that to come out. I'm saving my Morin for when my opponent, like right before my opponent plays Shani, because I assume there's a five strength card left in his graveyard for me to snipe. But even if it isn't that, I can get that unit that eats up armor and snipe that out with Morin. I'm going to go for value here and use Zoltan Shive on my side. I'm already in um, Scorch range. So you see he left a Lambert in his deck. Had I had Moran on the board, the Lambert would have died before summoning either the Vesemir or the Eskel, and that would have prevented 17 points. Instead, I hit his, uh, <laughs> I hit his unit and I <laughs> prevent him from eating the armor on his side of the board, and I have a 60-point like, advantage in the final round. Our next game is going to be up against King Bran. Again, when I'm facing King Bran, I'm thinking of the Captains and the Queen's Guard. I'm also thinking of War Longships. War Longships really mess up my strategies. So I tend to go open with a Shiru instead of with my time-sensitive cards. Now, I should have gotten rid of one of my Dragoons instead of the 
hawker support there, and that was a small um, misplay on my part. Because I'm probably not going to get any value out of my Dragoons. Due to the fact that a lot of King brand players play Revives, War Longships, and Locking Cards. I decided to bait his Locking Card into my Morin. I'm not going to use another Scorch anytime soon. I need that Scorch for the final round. So I'm going to be sequencing my cards so that my last card I play is a Scorch through my leader Enya. I'm going to be focusing on tempoing out. Here I could, uh, I'm going to open up with some Dragoons. I now have a really high point advantage, but again, my opponent can remove stuff from my side of the board, which makes this difficult. Okay. I'm going to thin my deck some more. Deck thinning is really powerful. I wish I had um, gotten slightly different cards here. It's good I waited before using Zoltan Shive because I needed him to use his Coral before I did that. Whenever cards are left in my opponent's hand, they do not want to play them, which is good. Okay, my opponent has a lot of carryover into this round, which is great. I unfortunately got um, both Truvial and Saskia. Neither of those cards I want in my final hand. They will hurt me having those cards. I'm just going to pass. There's no really easy way for me to get card advantage out of this round. Because he has so much of the uh, carryover through uh, Queen Ceres and the uh, those two cards. So I'm going to push. I'm really happy to get Bran. I'm going to open up with the Dragoon because Dragoon's time sensitive. I'm not scorching or damaging that uh, Skirmisher because it's oh, now I really wish I had not lost my last rate. What happened to my last rate earlier in the game is Donner on Hindar had uh, pulled it from my deck and put it into his graveyard. Now my shrooms are now in his uh, graveyard. Here I'm not hitting the captain, I'm hitting his skirmisher because I know he's going to end with the captains. I can go la um, scorch them for 34 points there and then an extra 12 points from my leader ability. I lost two points for not putting the uh, Elven Mercenary into the siege row because it could have been buffed by my Teruvial there. So the important thing to take from that is I sequence that Scorch. Our final game will be between Aditya and a Consume player. Aditya, as a reminder, doesn't have Shiru, instead runs Geralt Igni. But I want to showcase how Aditya uses Zoltan Shive creatively with Geralt Igni to kind of show you the flexibility of a movement set. One of the things I also like about Aditya is that this player listens to me when I say the value of lacerating the harpy eggs. As far as I'm concerned, removing a harpy and the harpy eggs is a 15 point play because the consume player is guaranteed to consume those eggs through the, their leader or what or whatnot. So removing this would be like 18 points in my book because you're getting rid of two um, harpies and then you're getting rid of the two eggs which are six points each. The eggs are, that is. So you're now moving towards tempo. There's really not much you can do against the... Uh, <laughs> the Arrakis Behemoth. You consider putting Zoltan Shive, but you hold your hand. Because the the um, the Vran Warrior is going to have has a timer. You can wait. See what your opponent does. Get some more tempo out on the board. Here, I don't know why you move the Elven Mercenary, but heads up play on moving the Vran Warrior. Now the opponent has to play something in order for it to consume something. And they, they're not going to have it consume an Arrakis Behemoth. They're going to have it consume the Crones. 
Because the Chrome is 8 strength and the Brand Warrior is 8 strength, you get this excellent Geralt Igni. Um, I'm not sure if you knew that your opponent had the Die Meridian Bomb or not. Because if, they, if you knew, then moving the Blue Mountain Commando didn't actually matter all that much. Actually didn't matter at all. But generally speaking, it's not like I would have moved the Blue Mountain Commando. What, I, what would you be afraid of? Here, you're getting the Illyrian onto the board. Your opponent puts two Neckers into their deck, which is fine. You're just getting more and more value. The longer this round goes on. You need to win this round. It's going to be a pain to win the next round if you can't. So you look at your deck to see what you have left. You don't have very many units left. You pull out Azur's Double Cross, which means that you can push your Bran away safely and not worry. However, if I were you, I would not have pushed the Bran out this round. I would have pushed her out the next round. Why? Because I could have pulled both of my ambush cards if I'd done that. I could have been more careful about what I mulligan out, you know? Here your opponent makes a mistake. They consume the eight, uh, the four strength card instead of the uh, eight strength card and it gives them a much weaker uh, Ekimara, or the three strength card, excuse me. You place your Bran out early just in case their last card's a gold card. You get to eat out the Fiend, which is great. It means you trade it up with their silver card by six points. I'm surprised by the Geralt Ard, frankly. It's like, you didn't even... <laughs> uh, and you dominated your opponent. If your opponent had a Grave Hag, you were well prepared for it. You were fortunate uh, a little bit that they didn't have that much luck, but even if they had the perfect ending there, they would have lost. And that's what's really important. You sequenced your last card, so you had the Bran and the Morin to kill, defeat your opponent. Good game. No matter what you people say, I'm gonna do my thing my way. No matter what you people do, I'm gonna do my thing much better than you. No matter what you say or do, oh boy, you're out of luck. It's gonna roll right off of me like water